first speaker is Hugh Ross from Reasons to Believe, and he's speaking on ancient Hebrews and Near Easterners' scientific sophistication. So welcome, Hugh. Well, thank you. And this first slide is simply a reminder that if you don't get to ask questions in this session, I do take questions on both my Facebook and Twitter page. And uh, Reasons to Believe does have a YouTube channel. Literally thousands of video clips are there for you to watch. And if you go to our booth just outside uh, this lecture hall, uh, you will find uh, this particular uh, book designed to the core. It's not yet released to the public. It just got published uh, three weeks ago. So you can uh, get an advanced copy of the book for free by going to our table. And for all of you that are participating virtually, if you scan that QR code, uh, likewise, we'll ship the book to you at no cost. And uh, the topic for my message today uh, is uh, ancient, uh, Near Eastern uh, science. Uh, what did the ancients really believe and understand about science? And uh, a lot of this comes from a course I took when I was a graduate student uh, from Donald Fernie. He's probably the foremost uh, historian of astronomy uh, that's alive today. Uh, but what I've been reading in the latest conservative scientific literature is this uh, declaration that the ancients really didn't care about astronomy or cosmology and knew nothing about it. I mean, one example is in the book uh, by John Walton, uh, where he says the material cosmos was little significance to people in the ancient Near uh, East. And therefore, we shouldn't expect there to be any statements of any meaning about astronomy or cosmology uh, within the Bible. Uh, you also have Peter Enns in his book, Inspiration and Incarnation, uh, declaring scientific investigation was not at the disposal of ancient Near Eastern peoples, basically making the point they didn't have the tools uh, to engage in any kind of enterprise in astronomy uh, or uh, cosmology. And then uh, John Walton in The Lost World of Genesis 1, he says of these ancients, they did not know that the sun uh, was much farther away than the moon or even further away than the birds flying in the air. And then two theologians in a recent book titled In the Beginning, We Did Not Understand, uh, they wrote the following, that the Old Testament authors seem to think of the land as a disk, not a globe. The mountains were at the edges of the disk holding up the sky. And uh, this is further amplified in a book by Walton and uh, Brent Sandy, The Lost World of a Scripture, uh, where they declare waters above represent an accommodation to the old world science. Everyone believed that there was a body of water submitted above the earth by some sort of solid dome. And what you're seeing in books written by many conservative uh, evangelical theologians in the 21st century is this concept of accommodationism, that the Holy Spirit in inspiring the Bible authors to write what they did on science, creation, history, geography, etc., accommodated their mistaken ideas, accommodated their errors. So they claim following Peter Enns and Kenton Sparks, there's this partnership between the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit reveals in the Bible is truth, but the partner, the human author, the Holy Spirit tolerates and accommodates uh, their mistaken notions about science, history, and geography. And so we have this uh, belief uh, that Everyone in the ancient Near East, in fact, there are books written claiming that everybody, as far as the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Chinese, uh, believed that the earth was flat, 
and that, that these flat, solid earth was suspended on an ocean, and that there was a solid dome above the flat earth, and above the solid dome uh, was water that was connected to the ocean below, and there were these little holes within the solid dome. That's where the rain came through. And as far as the stars, they weren't far away. Uh, they were attached to the inside of the solid dome above the flat earth. And so you'll see today many books insisting that this cosmological view uh, is presumed to be held by all the ancient cultures, and in particularly by those in the Near and Middle Eastern, and this would include the ancient Hebrews that God was inspiring to write scripture. But I remember Donald Fernie addressing this when I was a graduate student, and I'm addressing this in some of my books, is that all the ancients, particularly those in the Middle East, uh, were aware of limitations in irrigation. They were growing their crops in both Egypt and Mesopotamia using irrigation, and they were well aware that there was a limit to how high above the water level you could pump water. And this is, we're talking feet. We're not talking miles above the surface of the earth or thousands of miles above the surface of the earth. So they all well understood that this idea that there was water suspended over a solid dome uh, that was connected to an ocean that was suspending a flat earth was utterly impossible. They knew that just from uh, their attempts at irrigating water from the river onto the agricultural land. Uh, that there was a limit with this. And an Assyrian uh, specialist, Wilford Lambert, uh, wrote that he could find no evidence whatsoever that the Mesopotamians believed in a hard dome heaven. And you can go online and you'll find a 40-page paper uh, written by Seventh-day Adventist theologians. It's titled The Myth of the Solid Heavenly Dome. And they basically document in that 40-page paper that no one in the ancient cultures believed in a flat earth with a solid metal dome above it. This is a complete myth. No one believed it. And the problem is, is that people looking at this ancient literature are failing to distinguish between scientific literature, historical literature, uh, and fantasy literature. And just to give you an example of how this plays out, because what we're seeing in this paper, the myth of the solid dome, is that this is typical of human cultures throughout all ages, is that we write scientific literature, historical literature, there's political literature, uh, religious literature, and there's this uh, fantastical uh, literature, and we need to distinguish between them. This is even true of our time. So, for example, imagine, if you will, archaeologists 3,500 years in the future, and they're digging around here in Southern California, and they uncover the ruins of Hollywood. And in those ruins, they find these film canisters, and they begin to look at these film canisters, and uh, what they discover in the film canisters are, are the Flintstones. And uh, so they look at the uh, Flintstones, Sorry, I'm not keeping up with this. Here we go. What archaeologists 3,500 years from now uncovering film canisters of the Flintstones, would they conclude that all 20th century AD humans believed that humans and dinosaurs cohabited and that humans were making pets out of the dinosaurs? Well, I'm arguing this is what was happening when people are looking at this ancient uh, literature. They're failing to distinguish between what is fantasy literature and what is intended to be scientific literature. But let me push this point a little further. They uncover these film canisters and they see this uh, picture of humans and dinosaurs cohabiting. And then another group of archaeologists 3,500 years from now, they begin uncovering ruins in the state of Kentucky. And they find this museum. And in this museum, what do they see? Uh, they see, again, humans and dinosaurs cohabiting, where humans are basically making pets out of the dinosaurs. And they say, this is a museum. So clearly, people in the 20th century seriously believe that humans and dinosaurs cohabited and humans were making pets out of the dinosaurs. 
And so, again, uh, when we look at ancient literature, we need to realize there's different kinds of literature and take the care in our scholarship to distinguish between the different kinds of literature. And then to address um, what we see in uh, John Walton and his colleagues' uh, comments, he says, the material cosmos was of little significance to the ancient peoples. Well, the problem with this is that we see astronomical observatories literally all over uh, the ancient world. And so you're probably aware of Stonehenge in Britain, and uh, there's actually many henges that have been uncovered uh, in Britain. Uh, this is the one in Avery, and it literally covers nine square miles. It's the most complex of the stone observatories that we see in England. This is one you're probably more familiar with. It's the best preserved of the uh, stone hinges. It's called Stonehenge itself. And uh, people have done detailed research on this, astronomers have, and realize this is not just built to study the positions of the moon and the sun and the planets, even individual stars and variable stars. It's a very complex uh, system. And uh, you actually see these stone hinges literally around the world. They're in Britain, Ireland, France, Germany, Malta, Egypt, and they date from 1800 BC uh, back to 4900 BC. So this is not just in the era of the biblical authors, it dates considerably before the era of the Old Testament of biblical authors. And the number of these stone circles is now recognized to be a minimum of 3,000, and it could be much higher. And there's yet been attempts to see if we see these in Asia. But at least from Britain all the way to Egypt and throughout the Mediterranean, uh, these uh, stone hinge observatories have been uh, uh, dug up. And you're probably familiar with this book. It's called Stonehenge Decoded. It was published in the late 1960s. But if you read that book, and when I took the course from John Fernie, he had us read this book because it makes a really solid case that these stone uh, uh, structures were used to deal to make very complex astronomical observations, mainly because the ancients wanted to be able to predict future lunar eclipses, solar eclipses, and the future movements of the five planets that are visible uh, by the naked eye. And some of this stuff actually shows up in the current astrophysical literature. So you'll find an article I've written at reasons.org, uh, but it goes back about a year ago uh, when a paper was published on the variable star Algol. And Algol is the brightest of the variable stars we can see in the sky. It's the second brightest star in the constellation Perseus. And it's two stars that are orbiting one another. And as one star crosses in front of the other star, it dims the light from that star. Well, the Egyptians were very much fascinated by these variable stars and literally would observe them every night for many, many centuries. And so astronomers recently looked into these ancient Egyptian records uh, going from uh, 3,000 years ago uh, to 4,500 years ago, and they're able to determine that these Egyptian astronomers were able to measure the variability period of the uh, Algol to four places of the decimal. And so they determined uh, that in uh, the year 1224, this is where they get the most accurate measurements, that the uh, Algol A eclipsed Algol B every 2.850 uh, days. And then they measured the rate of variation that we see today. It's slowing down slightly. Today it's 2.867328 uh, days. And they took that difference and the number of years and were able to determine that the change in the period of this variable star over the past 3,245 years means that Algol A has transferred 
a small amount of mass on an annual basis uh, to its partner star, Algol B, and that enabled astronomers to determine in more detail the physics of what's going on in the interior of both Algol A and Algol B. The point being, we couldn't have done this unless the ancients uh, were very meticulous in making their astronomical observations. And the course I took from Donald Fernie, he actually, in the part of that course, estimated at the height of which these Egyptian astronomers were making these detailed observations of the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets. Uh, he estimated that the Egyptian empire at that time was investing one-fifth of their gross domestic product uh, into supporting the observations of these astronomers. Now, to put that in terms of today's dollars, all of you astronomers in the audience, that means that you would be getting a budget from the U.S. government of $4 trillion per year. Can you imagine the amount of astronomical research you could do for $4 trillion per year? I mean, we think of how expensive the James Webb Space Telescope is. That's just a tiny drop in the bucket uh, compared to 20% of our gross domestic product. So, what does this really mean about what the ancients understood about astronomy and cosmology? Well, we understand that uh, Moses' contemporaries were very interested in lunar and solar eclipses. And what they noticed with the lunar eclipses is that you always get a curved shadow and the curvature is what you would expect from a spherical body. So it's by this means they discerned uh, that the moon and the sun had to be spherical bodies. And you say, well, how does this work with solar eclipses? Well, just like today, and this is documented in ancient literature as well, is that when you see a partial solar eclipse going through a tree with lots of deciduous leaves, where there's little pinholes in the leaves, you get a pinhole camera effect. And so many of you may have experienced this during a partial solar eclipse. So you can look at the ground and you can actually see a partial solar eclipse image on the ground. It's just like with the lunar eclipses, you always see a curved shape and the curved shape matches what you would only expect to see if the sun indeed was a spherical body. Now, what about the scriptures? Well, one thing I did is I went through the Bible and looked at all the places where it mentions the moon, the stars, and the sun. And just to make one example, the moon is mentioned in 42 different passages in the Bible. So it's not just that the ancient Mesopotamians and Egyptians were interested in astronomy. It's clear that the Bible authors were as well. And again, I'm borrowing this from my former professor, uh, Donald Fernie. He actually took us through uh, all the observations that these ancients were making of the sun, the moon, uh, the stars, the planets. And he was able to demonstrate that these ancients, uh, using the limited mathematics they had at that time, were able to make measurements <coughs> of the sun's distance. And in this case, the best measurement is accurate to better than 1% precision. And likewise, they got a very accurate measurement of the year, the length of time it takes the Earth uh, to go about the sun. Uh, the sun's diameter, the sun's distance, and uh, star's distances, that's not so accurate. It's like the sun's diameter, it's a factor of four too small uh, in their measurements. And the moon's distance, likewise, is a factor of three too small. And keep in mind, they're doing this all with naked eye observations. And so again, Fernie made the point. Uh, with the naked eye, you'd expect that they'd be underestimating uh, these measurements. But the whole point, they got it in the right ballpark. So within kind of a ballpark, they had an idea of the dimensions of the solar system. They knew the sun was much bigger than the Earth, uh, that it was distant. And they actually understood, this is well documented in the ancient literature, uh, that the sun was the center of the solar system. And you say, well, why did they do all of their calculations of the future distances of planets from an Earth-centered perspective? They didn't have algebra. 
Without the mathematics of algebra, it's impossible to predict the future positions of the five visible light, the visible planets uh, from a sun pr uh, center perspective. You can do it from an earth center perspective, but it can't be done from a sun center perspective. And a lot of people credit Copernicus for discovering heliocentrism. If you actually read the history of Copernicus, he lived in Poland, but he made several trips to Italy. And when he went to Italy, he visited the ancient libraries and he discovered that early Greek and Egyptian astronomers had discerned that indeed the sun was the center of the solar system and the earth revolved around the sun. Uh, they simply lacked the mathematics to use that as a basis for determining future positions of planets and to use it to predict uh, future solar and lunar uh, eclipses. And what you see is there is a debate uh, running around 1700 to 1800 to the early 1900s AD uh, about whether or not the ancients really understood that the world was flat or spherical. And again, I want to credit Donald Fernie. He made the point none of the ancients uh, believed that the world was flat. They all believed it was spherical. And he basically pointed out that you can go from uh, China, Japan, Korea, uh, Mongolia, all the way into uh, the Middle East and throughout Europe, and that uh, they well understood that we are on a spherical body. And there's actually four methods by which the ancients could use to determine the shape of the Earth. They could look at the stellar constellations. And so people living in Greece, for example, would not be able to see the same constellations as people living in Egypt and people living in Sudan uh, would actually be able to see more. And the fact that you can see different constellations at uh, different latitudes and different periods of time in the night. So if you go down to the Sudan, for example, the Big Dipper actually sets, whereas it doesn't set in uh, northern uh, Greece. And by that means they could determine that the Earth must be a spherical body. The obelisk shadow method was well used within Turkey and Egypt and Sudan. So they noticed at different latitudes that the shadow of the obelisk had different lengths. And they also use wells to do the same thing. And they noted the crow's nest effect, uh, that when you look at a distant mountain, you see the top of the mountain, you don't see the bottom of the mountain, or the ship, you see the top of the ship's mass first, and then later. So by these means, they all comprehended uh, that we must be living on a spherical earth. And uh, where did this idea that the ancients believed in a flat earth? It actually has been documented in two books that have been written. In fact, I think about 20 years ago, there was an historian who gave a lecture here at the American Scientific Affiliation based on his book, The Myth of a Flat Earth. And he basically documented that it was certain theologians uh, within the 1800s who were intent on uh, basically dismissing the Bible as the inerrant inspired word of God and basically foisted upon uh, people living at that time that the ancients believed in a flat earth. So where does it come from? It's the 18th century AD. It doesn't come uh, from the time before Christ. And what we see in Acts 7.22 is that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So this idea, well, okay, maybe the Egyptians were familiar with all this science. Maybe the Mesopotamians were, but not the Hebrews who are writing scripture. But it tells us in Acts 7 that Moses, as a prince of Egypt, would have been educated in all the sciences uh, of the uh, Egyptians at that time. And at the time that uh, Moses was uh, bringing about the Exodus is when we see the peak of scientific achievement, particularly in astronomy and cosmology in Egypt. So it's not just that the Egyptians knew about this stuff, but these poor ignorant Hebrews did not. These Hebrews uh, were not ignorant. They knew of this stuff. Now I wanna end my talk uh, by making two points, because what I'm seeing in some of this new theological literature is this idea that we in the 20th and 21st century have evolved. We've become more intelligent than the ancients. 
and uh, look at how little the ancients achieved and how much we've achieved in the past few centuries. And so they will appeal to naturalistic evolution and say, over the past few thousand years, we humans have evolved to become much more intelligent than people that preceded us. So maybe they didn't know much about science, but look at all we know about science. And one of the books we have at the book table out there is called Weathering Climate Change. And what I document in that book is that climate change actually is a marker of technological advance by human species. In fact, uh, several of us have reasons to believe are working on material about human exceptionalism where we're making the point that humans throughout all ages have had that technological motivation. They didn't always have the capacity uh, to advance technology, but they always had the motivation to do so. And I think that's explained in these incredibly complex uh, Stonehenge observatories that the ancients made. But I think a, a big factor is the fact that they were limited by not having the climate stability that we've been enjoying. And so this is a graph showing you the global mean temperature and basically makes the point that during the last ice age, the global mean temperature was jumping up and down by 10 degrees centigrade over time scales of several centuries, which explains why the human population during the last ice age was relatively small and uh, why there wasn't much evidence for technological advance. They had the challenge, oh, I need to move it along, thank you. Moses was educated here. Thank you. Here we go. Here's the temperature graph. But the challenge is with a global mean temperature jumping up and down by 10 degrees centigrade, you cannot specialize in the planting of your crops. Uh, if you were to do so, uh, you quickly discover that your crops fail. And so what we've now discovered in uh, archaeological finds is that the ancients were basically engaged in mixed farming on very small size scales. Now we have been able to document that they were planting grains, harvesting grains, uh, grinding them and roasting them and turning them into bakery products as far back as 36,000 years, but all done on a very small scale. Until 9,500 years ago, when the global mean temperature stabilized, where the global mean temperature over the past 9,500 years was stable to within plus or minus 0.65 degrees centigrade. But let me show you what it was like from 1,000 years ago till 1950. It literally was plus or minus 0 0.06 degrees. And I think I'm out of time. Okay, do we have time for questions or I'm already out of time? I didn't have my clock working, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And while Ram comes up, you can go ahead. If you want to go to another talk, go ahead, please, to, to the other rooms and ladder, uh, 101 and 102. Um, otherwise, while he's setting up, we could maybe entertain casually, informally, a question or two. So if you want to ask a question or two, yes, Kurt, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Hugh, I think I've asked you this before, but I forgot your answer. So uh, there's some quotes from Martin Luther in his commentary on Genesis where he uh, says pretty much that that the firmament was solid and the stars and and sun were placed in it. Um, and I believe Calvin had some similar comments. So um, why did they have that view if the ancients before them didn't? Yeah, I just commented on that book I'm bringing out. It's now an editorial uh, where I go extensively into what Luther and Calvin had to say. And uh, basically, what did they mean by set? They make the point, for example, that the word Nathan as translated as set in Genesis 1 has got about 30 different definitions that you can put in English. So I don't think they were implying uh, that uh, these things are being set uh, in the on some kind of a dome in there. In fact, what's interesting, you don't see the translation of vault or dome in any of the Bible translations until the uh, late 20th century. Uh, Bible translations before never did that. Thank you, Hugh. And you can follow up with you later if you want during the conference as well with other questions or check out the table, as you mentioned, out in the foyer. Mm -hmm.